the situation in the Middle East is really getting worse and worse. Um, the anger and the frustration that is uh, boiling in that part of the world creates long-term threats to the West that we really need to address. And of course, in Iran, the centrifuges are continuing to spin. Confrontation is rising. So it's not really an option for the United States to throw up its hands and just say, those crises have always been there, they'll always be there, we just can't really do anything about it. Or to continue to rely on tiny measures like sending an envoy to try to shuttle back and forth between Israel and the Palestinians. Those kinds of efforts have not succeeded in the past. Actually, negotiation has become the enemy of peace when you come to the Israel-Palestine thing. It's used as a way to prolong the conflict indefinitely. Uh, so I start from the uh, principle that our, for our foreign policy toward the Middle East is stuck. It's not working. Uh, during the Cold War, we had a certain policy. The world has changed tremendously. The security environment in the Middle East has changed tremendously. And the security threats to the United States, as well as the new security opportunities that the Middle East presents us with, uh, have also changed dramatically. But our policy hasn't changed. So I'm trying to break American foreign policy, particularly in this case our foreign policy toward the Middle East, out of its rut. Uh, there's a tremendous tendency in the foreign policy establishment to stick to established ideas and stick with old paradigms. Uh, any new idea is treated as the germ of some frightful plague that needs to be stamped out before it spreads and infects the whole policy apparatus. So we're caught in this very narrow spectrum of acceptable opinions. And anyone that's outside that spectrum is stigmatized as a kind of a wacko who needs to be kept outside the room whenever serious matters are discussed. It reminds me of that great line from uh, Dorothy Parker when she was asked what she thought about uh, Catherine Hepburn and she said, uh, Catherine Hepburn runs the gamut of emotions from A to B. That's about the, the width of uh, what's acceptable in our foreign policy and I'm, I'm trying to widen that. now. What has been our foreign policy in the Middle East uh, over these last decades? Essentially, it's been shaped according to at least the perceived interests of Saudi Arabia and Israel. In Washington, the assumption has generally been what Saudi Arabia wants, Saudi Arabia gets. What Israel wants, Israel gets. Now, it was traditionally assumed during the Cold War that uh, our relationship with Saudi Arabia was based on oil and our relationship with Israel was based on history and shared values. Uh, that was partly true, but actually there's another aspect to this, and I have a whole section in my book about it, and that is that during the Cold War, Israel and Saudi Arabia were doing favors for us that no other country could or would do. These were a lot of favors that were not public at the time. Saudi Arabia and Israel were always willing to help the United States in its clandestine, secret, covert Cold War operations. Our NATO allies were not willing to do that. They were willing to support the United States in public and in ways that were legal. But sometimes the United States needed support that wasn't legal. And Saudi Arabia and Israel were always there to help us. For example, when President Reagan wanted to arm the military dictatorship in Guatemala during the 1980s, he was not able to do that because the Congress had banned aid to Guatemala, but he still wanted to send them guns, so he got the Israelis to arm the Guatemalan army. When the United States was not able to aid South Africa militarily, Reagan also arranged for Israel to provide that aid and then get quid pro quos another way. Saudi Arabia did the same thing. Saudi Arabia contributed millions of dollars to support the Contras in Nicaragua when the United States wanted to support them but was not allowed to do so legally. Saudi Arabia bankrolled the Mujahideen War in Afghanistan. So Israel and Saudi Arabia were providing us with a lot of favors that we didn't know about at the time. And I think that did account for part of the closeness in that relationship. So that era is over. Now, we're looking towards the 21st century. We want to try to reconfigure uh, American foreign policy, and we want to do it in a way that's long-term. One of the great shortcomings of American foreign policy making is we're so short-term oriented. Uh, 
we like to do things that will get fixed uh, in a day or a week. We want to get everything done quickly, and we don't often stop to think about the long-term effects of what we do. Uh, we also tend to be emotional in our making of foreign policy, and we do things that make us feel good and redeem our emotions at the moment. But sometimes years or even decades later, we look back and see that that feel good faded away very quickly and actually what we did has wound up undermining our own national security. So as we look at the Middle East, we're looking for big new ideas and long lasting, long range ideas. And what could those be? So in my book, uh, I talk about the two countries in the Middle East that have had a long tradition uh, of building democracy. Two Muslim nations that have had a constitution for a hundred years and whose people have really come to assimilate the, the democratic idea. Those are Turkey and Iran. Uh, in terms of their understanding of democracy, the Turkish people and the Iranian people are far ahead of most of the other people in the Muslim Middle East. I really believe democracy can take hold anywhere but with a couple of caveats. First of all, it takes time. Uh, democracy is not just an election. Democracy is a whole way of dealing with life's problems. Uh, you cannot uh, make this kind of a psychological change overnight. It takes years or decades or even generations. Uh, and Turkey and Iran are the only two Muslim countries in the Middle East that have been working on this project for generations. In addition, democracy cannot emerge in a country after it is brought to that country by a foreign army at the point of a gun. Nobody accepts ideologies that are imposed that way. That didn't happen in Turkey and Iran. Turks and Iranians decided a hundred years ago themselves that they wanted a kind of a government that would reflect popular will. Uh, and they have been working for a hundred years, not without setbacks, towards this goal. So the Turkish society and Iranian society are probably the most democratic in the Muslim Middle East. Of course, the regime in Iran is something different, but having just returned from Iran a couple of weeks ago, uh, I can report that the effervescence of democratic society in Iran is, is amazing, and the pro-American sentiment there is quite astonishing. It's one of the very few places probably in the whole world where if you stand on a street corner and start telling people you're American, you'll draw a very excited crowd of people that will tell you how much they love America. It's a little bit of a disconnect when you think, oh, wait a minute, I guess I'm in Iran now. How did this happen? Uh, so uh, what might be the outlines of this policy? First of all, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen some uh, bursts of news that, that have to do with these two countries. The first one came when Turkey and Brazil negotiated that deal with Iran, uh, which I think they hoped would be a way out of the escalating nuclear confrontation. I was actually in Turkey uh, a couple of weeks ago on the day when it was announced that uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey and his Brazilian comrade had succeeded in striking a deal with Iran about the removal of a certain amount of uranium to Turkey and a set of other uh, con uh, policies to try to ease the nuclear crisis. And everybody in Turkey was thrilled. People thought Finally, this confrontation in a neighboring country uh, has been defused, and we're not going to have another situation like Iraq, where we had a country on our border that was in complete upheaval and misery and war for years. Uh, so the Iran crisis looks like it's now going to ratchet down. Well, it only took a few hours until people in Washington started waking up and reading the news that Turkey and Brazil had broken this deal with Iran. and. To the great surprise of many people in Turkey, the Americans said, we don't want anything to do with this deal. This is a terrible idea. And Brazil and Turkey really got snookered. Uh, the American attitude was essentially that the leaders of those two countries were like stupid, naive schoolboys who got fooled by those ever crafty Iranians. Uh, so this was, I think, uh, quite surprising, not only to many Turks, but also to Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey, who I think really believed he was doing the U.S. a favor and believed that he was acting on behalf of the U.S. Now, he, both he and Lula claimed to have had contacts from Washington, including letters. Um, whether that reflects a division within the administration or the passage of time or some other misunderstanding, we still don't know. But the fact is, Turkey's effort to ratchet down this crisis did not work. 
And I think that did start to cause some friction with uh, the United States.